Room 13 by Robert Swindells, Chapter 3. They were off by twenty-five past nine, growling slowly up the drive while Mr Joyce and a handful of parents stood in a haze of exhaust waving. Fliss and Lisa managed to get seats together. Lisa had the one by the window. As the coach turned onto the road, she twisted round for a last glance of the school. Goodbye, bottom top, she cried, and good riddance. That'll do, Lisa, what now? Startled, she turned. Mrs Evans was sitting two rows behind, glaring at her through the space between headrests. Yes, miss. She faced the front, dug Fliss in the ribs and giggled. I didn't know she was sitting so close. Where's Mrs Marriott? Back seat so she can keep an eye on us all. And Mr Hepworth's up there with the driver. Hmm. Trust teachers to grab all the best seats. Who's this in front of us? The tops of two heads showed above the headrests. Gary Bazard and David Trotter. I hope we're nowhere near them in the hotel. You won't be said Ellie May, who was sitting across the aisle from Fliss. Ah, Shelley says they put the girls on one floor and boys on another, so you don't see each other with nothing on. Ah, Shelley, sneered Fliss. Ah, Shelley says this. Ah, Shelley says that. I hope we're not going to have a week of what ah, Shelley says, Ellie May. Huh. Ellie May tossed her head. I was telling you how it'll be. That's all misery guts. Anyway, you can naff off if you want to know out else. You won't get it from me. Good. Fliss shuffled in her seat, turning as far from Ellie May as she could and sat scowling across Lisa at the passing scene. Lisa looked at her. What's up with you? she hissed. We're supposed to be enjoying ourselves, and you look like somebody with toothache going into double maths. It's her, Fliss joked her head in Ellie May's direction. She gets on my nerves. She was only telling you you wanted to know if we'd be anywhere near Baz and Trot. And she said we won't. What's wrong with that? Fliss shrugged. Nothing. Well then, I don't feel too good, right? I had this dream last night, a nightmare, and I couldn't sleep after it. And then this morning in the hall, Bazard starts going on about Dracula, saying he lives in Whitby, stuff like that, and I wasn't in the mood. Lisa pulled her face. No need to take it out on other people, though, is there? You could go to sleep here, on the coach. Look, the seat tips back. Lie back and shut your eyes. There's nothing to look at anyway, unless you like the middle of Leeds. So Fliss pressed the button on the armrest and tipped her seat back, but then the boy in the seat behind yelled out that she was crushing his knees and demanded that she return it to its upright position. When she refused, settling back and closing her eyes, the boy, Grant Cooper, began rhythmically kicking the back of her seat, like somebody beating on a drum. Fliss sighed but kept her eyes closed, saying nothing. As she had anticipated, Mrs Evans soon noticed what the boy was up to. A hand came sneaking through the gap between the headdress and grabbed a fistful of his hair. Ow! he yelped. Mrs Evans rose so that the top part of her face appeared over the seat. She began speaking very quietly to Grant Cooper, punctuating her words by alternately tightening and relaxing her grip on his hair. Grant Cooper, squeeze. The upholstery on that seat cost a lot of money, squeeze. It was fitted to make this coach both smart and comfortable, squeeze. It was not provided so that horrible little so-and-sos like you could use it for football practice, squeeze. How do you think your mother would like it if somebody came into your house and started kicking the back of her three-piece sweeter? Squeeze. Eh? Squeeze. Like it, would she? Squeeze. Please, miss. No, miss. Grant's eyes were watering copiously and his mouth was twisted into a grimace which would have not been out of place in a medieval torture chamber. Well then, squeeze, kindly show the same respect for other people's property that your mother would expect to be shown to hers. All right, Grant Cooper? Squeeze. Yes, miss. The grip loosened. The hand withdrew. Grant slumped like a man cut down from the whipping post and wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. Mrs Evans's face sank from view. Fliss smiled faintly to herself and drifted off to sleep. Chapter 4 Fliss opened her eyes as the coach swung into a tight turn which nearly catapulted her into the aisle. What's happening? Where are we? Pick her in, said Lisa. We're stopping. You've been asleep ages. Fliss looked out. They were rolling onto a big car park with a wall around it. As the coach stopped, Mr Hepworth stood at the front. This is Pickering, he said, and we are making a toilet stop. His eyes swept along the coach and locked onto those of a boy near the back. A toilet stop, Keith Halliday. Not a shopping stop, not a sightseeing stop, not a let's buy packets of greasy fish and chips, scots the lot before Sir Caesar's and then throw up all over the coach stop. Have I made myself quite clear, sir? Right, the toilets he pointed, are down there at the bottom of this car park. To get into them, you have to go out to the pavement. It's a very busy road, and I don't want to see anyone trying to cross it. Neither do I want to see boys going into the ladies' toilet or girls into the gents. Have I said something funny, Andrew Roberts? No, sir. 
Right, he looked at his watch. It's ten past eleven. The coach will leave here at twenty-five past on the dot. Make sure you're on it, because it's a long walk back to Bradford. When we get back on, whispered Fliss to Lisa, it's my turn for the window seat, right? Lisa nodded. You feeling better then? Yes, thanks. I had a lovely sleep. I know you missed a lot, though. There was this field, a sloping field with millions of poppies in it. The whole field was red. It was ace. When Fliss got back on the coach, there was no sign of Lisa. She sat down and watched the kids straggling across the tarmac in the warm sunshine. Soon, everybody was back on board except her friend. The driver had started the engine and Mrs Marriott was counting heads when Lisa appeared from behind the toilet block and came hurrying to the coach. As she clambered aboard, Mr Hepworth looked at his watch. What time did I say we'd be leaving, Lisa, what, ma? Some of the children were sniggering and Lisa blushed. Twenty-five past, sir? I forgot the time, sir. You forgot the time? Well, for your information, it is now twenty-six minutes to twelve and we'll be lucky if we arrive at the hotel by midday, which is when we are expected. The meal which is being prepared for us might well be ruined and it will all be your fault, Lisa Watman. He bent forward, suddenly peering at her jeans. And what have you got there? Something was making a bulge in the pocket of Lisa's jeans and she was trying to conceal it with her hand. Nothing, sir? Take it out and give it to me. It's just this, sir. She pulled out an object wrapped in tissue paper and handed it over. The teacher stripped away the wrapping to reveal a green plastic torch in the shape of a dragon. The bulb and its protective glass were in the dragon's gaping mouth. Mr Hepworth held up the torch using only his thumb and forefinger and looked at it with an expression of extreme distaste. Did you bring this, this thing with you from home, Lisa Watmow? No, sir. Oh, then I suppose there's a little kiosk inside the ladies' toilet where patrons can do a little bit of shopping, am I right? No, sir. The teacher frowned. Then I'm afraid I don't understand. You didn't bring it from home and you didn't get it in the ladies. You haven't been anywhere else, yet here it is. Perhaps you laid it, like a hen lays an egg, did you? No, sir. Then what did you do? I went in a shop, sir. You did what? Went in a shop, sir. And what had I said about shopping, Lisa Watmow, just before you got off the coach? We weren't to do any, sir? Right. Then why did you go into that shop? I don't know, sir. You don't know, and neither do I, but here's something I do know. This evening, when the rest of the group is listening to a story in the hotel lounge, you will be in your room writing two apologies. One to the children for having kept them waiting, and one to me for having disobeyed my instructions. When both apologies have been written to my satisfaction, this torch will be returned to you. In the meantime, you can leave it with me. Go to your seat. What the heck did you do that for? whispered Fliss as Lisa slid into her seat. Lisa was one of those girls who seldom step out of line and are rarely in trouble at school. She shook her head miserably. I don't know, Fliss. I don't even need a torch. I've got a better one at home. You'll think I'm crazy, but I couldn't help it. It was as though my feet were going by themselves. Oh, don't you start, groaned Fliss. What do you mean? Nothing, forget it. She looked out of the window. They passed a sign. North Yorkshire Moors National Park. The coach was climbing. Fliss glazed out as green pastures gave way to treeless desolation. She shivered.